We're so honored to have everybody in this house this morning. We're so thankful for Jason and Summer to be here and their wonderful children. And, and it's because of them that I've got connected with Brother Kraft. And I met him at a conference. And I think it was the next service he was preaching for you guys. I said, what's the chances? And I called Pastor Ricky and he said, well, we don't have church Sunday night if they want to come. I said, absolutely. And we've been friends and connected ever since. This is a true evangelist, a man that has a word for this house this morning. He's been in a weeks of revival. People get the Holy Ghost, getting delivered. And God just released him so he could be with us this morning. Now, before I bring him up here, let me say to the kids, I know you're sad because we don't have no Sunday school. But don't you sit down on me because I'm taking you to hijinks in Jonesboro. And it's going to be the greatest day you ever had in your life. So we'll say amen. So I need everybody in a good mood and everybody ready to receive the word of God. So we'll say amen. Young people, old people, middle-aged people, single, white, black, purple. Let's all give God a shout of praise right now. Come on. Brother Kraft, come on and obey God. Come on, do better than that. Let's make some noise for the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. High five somebody and tell them you look better than I do today. Amen. Well, some of you don't believe that. Just go ahead and tell them what you really think. Say, I look better than you do today. Amen. Praise God. What a honor. I am humbled and honored to be here in this spiritually significant moment in the life of this great church, in the ministry, uh, Brother and Sister Parr and their family. Uh, these folks are the real deal, aren't they? And I know you appreciate them so very much. And God bless you, and I commend you for standing with your pastor and his family for 27 years. Turn to somebody and tell them that's a long time. We're not as young as we used to be, Brother Parr. I'm 50 as well. I'm in the 50 club. But uh, God bless you for standing with them, supporting them, and the vision of this church. And uh, for the, all of these years, 27 years. How many of you have been here 25 years plus? Let me see your, your hand. 20 years plus. You've been here 20 years plus. How about 10 years plus? Let me see who you are. All right. How many of you have been here in the last two or three years? Wave your hand. Let's give all of these folks a great hand. Because you can't build a great church without great people. And so I commend you for supporting them. There's something about it, God. Uh, there is a holy union between uh, God and ministries and between churches and ministries. Because I've seen this. I've been preaching 30 plus years now. And full-time pastor, missionary, evangelist, all of that. And I have seen it north, south, east, and west that God blesses ministries. And the church is blessed as the ministry is blessed. And the ministry is blessed as the church is blessed. It's reciprocal. It's a cycle. Amen. That's why you ought to pray every day, God bless my pastor and his family. Because as they are blessed, you are blessed. Amen. That's the Word of God. That's the Word of God. Amen. You ought to pray every day. I know they pray for you folks every day. And I know you appreciate them and have stood with them, behind them. And I give honor to them today and their great work. And it's an honor to be here on this special day. And if it's all right, I'm just going to obey the Holy Ghost and just do what I feel. Uh, I've got many uh, dedicatory, uh, anniversary type sermons and formal things. But uh, in prayer last night, I was driving in. In fact, uh, I watched the whole service with you guys last night. And I was having church just driving down the road. Amen. And I was blessed by the word last night. And um, as I was driving in, I really felt to go this direction that the Lord laid upon my heart. So I'm just going to do my best to do the work of an evangelist uh, and obey the Lord today. We're turning to the book of John, the fifth chapter, John chapter 5. <clears throat> and we'll begin in verse number 1. Give honor to Elder Cordell. I bless you, praying for you and your wife. 
always good to be with uh, this family and Zach and just everybody here. I feel like I'm at home here, and uh, you folks have always treated me very, very kindly, and I sincerely appreciate that. I regret my wife couldn't come with me today. As Pastor mentioned, I've been up in a revival in Louisville uh, four or five weeks in a church there, and uh, God confirming His Word with signs and wonders and miracles. We had a young man that walked in. He was covered in a rash that he'd been through three rounds of antibiotics. Doctors couldn't figure it out, couldn't get it taken care of. He walked in the service, came to the altar, covered visibly that you could see, and it was horrible. He was suffering so bad. We prayed for him. The Lord touched him, and instantly the rash disappeared from head to toe. What the doctors and the medicine couldn't do, God can do in just one touch, can he? How many know he's a healer? He's a miracle worker. And so we drove in from there, and my wife, of course, wanted to be here, tried to be here, but we couldn't make arrangements for our 11-year-old in school to get to school and uh, all of the family things that we all have to deal with. Amen. John chapter 5 and verse number 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, powerless, weak, anemic, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool. And troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Somebody say thirty eight years. That's a long time to suffer. But he had been suffering for thirty eight years. In verse six it says, When Jesus saw him, he saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time. In that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Turn to your neighbor and ask him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. He began to give an excuse and the reasons why. He could not receive a miracle. Notice in verse 7, he began to explain logical, viable reasons. Sir, I have no man, but when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Somebody was always beating him to his miracle. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately, and immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And immediately, somebody say, and immediately. Shout it again. And immediately, the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. If you notice in the beginning of our reading, it says here that there were five porches in Jerusalem. Verse number 2, by the sheep market, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Would you say that out loud? Bethesda. Bethesda, which being interpreted, meant a house of mercy. A house of mercy. Amen. Aren't you thankful you're in a house of mercy today? Amen. I believe the church, if anywhere else, ought to be the house of mercy. It ought to be the house of God. Amen. I want to preach from that today. Simple thought, but I do feel led of the Holy Ghost. A miracle at a place called mercy. A miracle at a place 
called mercy. We need the help of the Lord today. Would you put your Bibles down and pray with me? Let's really pray and touch the Lord. All the monitor you can, brother. Amen. Lord, we thank you today for your precious anointing that has been upon this service already from the very beginning. Lord, we thank you for the move of your Spirit last night and the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. We ask that you would meet with us again today, for you have ordered our steps to be in this place. You've ordered my steps and my path. You've ordered every guest's steps, every faithful saint of God to be here, Lord. I pray that you would help me to deliver the word that you've put into my spirit. Help me to be obedient, Lord, and not be bound up, but to flow in faith and the flow of the spirit of what you want to do in people's lives right here today. Touch my mind and my mouth. Help me to speak nothing but what thus saith the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Give the Lord a great hand clap of praise. Amen. Shake somebody's hand again before you're seated and say, I'm going to help that preacher preach today. He looks like he needs it. Amen. A miracle in a place called mercy. Let me first of all today draw your attention to two of the first miracles that Jesus ever performed because these two miracles, if I can mention them briefly, they really help better set up the text that I read into your hearing this morning. The Bible said, if you will remember the first miracle of our Messiah, or Jesus' ministry, we find where he went to a marriage celebration in a place called Canaan. And most of you have heard the story many times, young and old, how that the governor of the feast had to reluctantly announce that they had no more wine to serve the guests that had come for this big party and celebration. Now, first you have to understand that a wedding in that day and time was one of the biggest uh, events on a yearly calendar. It was one of the greatest parties. It would last sometimes a, an entire week where people would gather together and celebrate the union of the couple. So it was a great celebration. Well, all of the important people in town and all of the dignitaries and the high and the low and the rich and the poor had come to his house to celebrate and he had to uh, deal with a very embarrassing situation. And so the Bible said that Mary came to Jesus and said, Son, it seems that our host has run out of wine, implying that she thought he ought to do something about the problem. And so she then calmly and confidently turns to the servants that were there and said, He's about to give you instruction or tell you something to do. And whatever it is that He tells you to do, if you won't argue but just try and do it, uh, then your problem is about to be worked out. Maybe somehow she understood what was about to happen. Not only did He have the answer, but He is the answer. How many of you know that Jesus is the answer? So he not only had the answer, but he personified. He was the answer, robed in flesh. And so Jesus, the answer, simply told them to fill the water pots with water. His solution seemed simplistic, almost as if he didn't really comprehend the problem. Ridiculous even, what he asked them to do. But thankfully, they did not argue. They thought, why not try it? What's it going to hurt to try what he's telling us to do? So they went and gathered the pots that they could, the barrels that they could, and they filled the water pots with just normal H2O, plain old water. And they brought them to Jesus and said, He said unto them, Draw out now and give to the governor of the feast. And when they drew out, what they thought was just normal water. Somehow, 
The common had become the uncommon. The ordinary had become the extraordinary. Jesus was beginning His miraculous ministry, the very first miracle that He ever performed. He established the precedent. He established the principle that He is a God of transformation. That it doesn't matter what kind of a problem that you present Him with if you simply obey obey the instruction that He gives unto you, your problem is about to be worked out. Hallelujah. Jesus is the answer. And Jesus has the ability to take the most embarrassing situations in our life. And it's shameful and embarrassing and we're humiliated. But if we allow the Lord to work in our life, He can take that embarrassment and that shame and He can transform your problem into a party and a time of rejoice. Come on, clap your hands and thank God. He is a God of transformation. Amen. You believe that shall praise the Lord. He established the fact from the very beginning that He is a God of transformation. That is the gospel in a nutshell. The good news that we can walk in a dirty, rotten, common, ordinary sinner. Hallelujah. And we can come to an altar and repent of our sins, giving our heart unto the Lord. And we can lift our hands after having repented and be filled with the glorious gift of His Spirit. Hallelujah. And then we can be buried in Jesus' name for the remission of all of our past sins and shortcomings and failures. That's the good news of the gospel, folks. We can walk in a sinner and leave a saint. We can walk in addicted and leave delivered. We can walk in with rags of unrighteousness and brokenness. And He gives us robes of redemption and restoration. Lift our hands and thank the Lord that He is a God of transformation this morning. He can take an old ordinary sinner like you and me and leave. We can walk in one way and leave a different way. Hallelujah. That's the Word of God. That's the simplicity of the Gospel in a nutshell. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Amen. I'll never forget when Dale and Valerie walked in, Pastor. They walked in and they had planned to go to another church on that Sunday morning. They walked in, sat back on the back left uh, from the pulpit. And I was watching them worshiping God. They slipped in late. I didn't know who they were. Never met them before. But in the midst of the service, the Spirit of the Lord began to move. They lifted their hands, began to weep. I watched tears streaming down their face. I went back to them, uh, told them what I felt the Lord wanted me to tell them, not publicly, not in the mic uh, at that particular time. They broke me to worship the Lord. Tears streaming down their face. And I watched God fill that man and that woman with the baptism of His Spirit. And then their two kids. I didn't know the story that they had come. Their marriage was breaking apart. Their home had been shattered. They'd gotten addicted to uh, painkillers and drug addiction. And that led to harder drugs and an even a greater hit and a stronger hit. It led to all kinds of things having to then, of course, deal some things so that they could support the habits and things that got in the hold of them. But I watched that day. Then they ran to the altar. I baptized and rebaptized them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Amen. He was broke and losing his business. Going bankrupt. Losing his marriage. But when he left the altar that day and the baptistry that day, God healed their marriage and healed their home. God began to bless his business. Amen. You fast forward a few months down the road he became a board member he became the spiritual leader in my church he became my confidant God blessed his business amen to where he became the number one tithe giver and offering giver where he could give a hundred thousand a year amen to support missions and the work
work of God. Why are you saying that, preacher? I'm telling you that God is a God of restoration. That you may be the biggest sinner in the city of Kennett, Missouri. And it doesn't matter how you walked in here. You walked into a church that believes that this is a house of mercy and that He is a God of transformation. You believe God can transform anybody? Give the Lord a great hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Turn and tell your neighbor, God can do it. Amen. Smile at Him and say, God's done it for me. God can do it for anybody. That's the first miracle Jesus ever performed. He established, I'm a God of transformation. Then we are taken to a story where the Bible said that Jesus went to church. Jesus went to church. He went to the synagogue and he found there a man that had walked in with an unclean spirit at church. Can you imagine that? Anybody ever seen somebody with an unclean spirit at church? Come on, wave your hand. Don't point at anybody. Don't nudge anybody. You seen somebody with a bad attitude or a bad spirit at church? This man came with a bad spirit, an unclean spirit. Hallelujah. But notice, Jesus refused to allow him to continue to suffer if he really wanted to be delivered. Because when Jesus comes to church and he's here today every spirit of bondage and brokenness can be broken and shattered every shackle that holds somebody back it can be shattered in the presence of Jesus Christ and when we come in contact with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and he touches us I'm telling you it will bring about change in your life Amen. The devil spoke out and that man that had a bad spirit at church and said, Leave me alone, preacher. Leave me or leave us is what he actually said. Leave us alone. We don't want any part of the ministry of this man called Jesus. Hallelujah. I've pastored a long time, 15 years. I've traveled another 15 full time. And you know how you can usually tell who has a bad spirit when they come to church. I'm going to look at my notes so I'm not making eye contact with anybody in the house. This probably is in Mississippi and not an issue here in Missouri. But usually those that cry out with the spirit or attitude that says, Leave us alone, preacher. Leave me be the way that I am. Why have you come to torment me or irritate me or make me uncomfortable or convict me? Come on, preacher. I don't want to change this. I don't want to change this in my life. I want to stay the way that I am. Now, if that's the way you feel today, nobody's going to force you or make you to do anything. But when I come to the house of God and the preacher begins to preach, I've got the attitude that says, preach to me, pastor. Preach to me, evangelist. Don't let me be lost. Don't let me go to hell. If I've got something in my life that needs to be burned up and changed, somebody preach to me. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's the way you feel, shout yes. Shout yes and amen. And Jesus, the Bible said, He said, hold your peace and come out. He spoke with authority and anointing. And immediately, the Bible said, immediately, right then and that moment, the moment He spoke the Word and took authority, the devil that had been tormenting that man and attacking that man and giving him grief, amen, had to turn loose and leave that man alone and leave the church. That's the power of the Gospel. That's the power of getting in the presence of Jesus Christ. Everything that's attacked you and come against you and your family, 
and your business and your home and your marriage when you get in the presence of the Lord like last night when you get in a fire of the presence of revival and the presence of the Lord it will burn things out of our life and spirits that have attacked us and abused us we can walk away with the victory and the liberty in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Because not only is He a God of transformation, but He is a God of deliverance. Hallelujah. Am I preaching to anybody today that God's ever delivered you from something? Would you just wave your hand? Come on, look around you. He's a God of deliverance. He's a God of deliverance. Hallelujah. I watched Andy uh, the night that I had a guest preacher, an evangelist, a prophet, if you please. And he was sitting over here. He just walked in. I'd been pastoring his wife and kids, um, Brother Parr. And I didn't know. I knew that they were divorced. I didn't know his story. But he was sitting back here on the right about where you're sitting, Brother, in the white shirt, about like that. And I watched the evangelist walk up the aisle and begin to talk to him. Hey, Amen. I'm not picking on you. All right, everybody understand whatever I'm about to say. I'm not talking about this man right here. I'm talking about Andy. Is that all right? You got it? And so I didn't know the story, but they were divorced. He'd backslid running from God for many, many years. He, uh, he was a white dude, but he'd gotten involved with the Mexican mafia in, in Texas. And he was part of the drug mule. He knew where their, their warehouses were, where the tunnels were. One of the guys that he uh, made trips with was called Trigger Tin Man because they had a, he had at least ten hits that he had taken care of and people he'd taken out uh, in, in destruction of the mafia. So that's who Andy was hanging with. And he had decided that God couldn't love him anymore, that he'd gone too far and done too much. And so he came to church. He walked in. He'd made a decision. He gave his ex-wife $10,000, bought her a van. He was there to see his kids. And he already bought the gun. He was going out. And he was going to kill himself. That's how Andy walked into church that night. It was his last service. The last time he said he'd ever be at church. And God moved upon that evangelist and prophet. He walked back up to that man and he said son the Lord told me to tell you take the flowers off of the casket you're not going to die but God loves you and you're going to live and how hell has tormented you you're about to burn up the devil the way that hell has burnt you up I didn't know it Andy had a few burn scars and things he'd gotten involved in and when, when he got that word from the Lord, he threw his hands in the air. He ran to the altar. God refilled Andy with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. He began to speak fluently in that heavenly language. I rebaptized him in Jesus' name. I gave him the key to my office. I couldn't tell him to go back to doing what he was doing. Amen. I couldn't do that biblically as a pastor and uh, just taper it off and make a few more trips. I couldn't do that. And so, Andy, I said, God will protect you. God will honor you. He said, it's blood in, blood out, Pastor. And, and But I don't know what else to do. He went back to those men. I gave him. The, he started living in my office uh, for several months. I found him a job. He used my personal shower. Amen. And then Andy, of all things, he went back. He said, you can't run from him. He sat down and began to tell him his story, what God had done for him. When God was going to give him his marriage back, his family back, and he was going to live for God. He said, you can kill me if you want to. Here I am. I'm not running. That, that mafia dude, tears began to stream down his cheeks. They have great respect for men of God and the house of God. He said, Andy, if this is real, first he slid 150000 cash across to him. said, if you'll just make two more trips, Andy, it's all yours. And he said, no. He said, I'm here to face you, to take the medicine. You want to kill me? Here I am. He began to give his testimony. They let Andy get up and walk away from there. Came back to church. I'm telling you, you talk about a soul winner, Brother Parr. You talk about a soul winner. Andy filled several pews up with people sharing his testimony of what God, that God's a God of deliverance. He's a God of transformation. How many of you know what I'm talking about? He can do that. He can do that. We had, we had a man that, I don't know why I feel to say this, but I'm just going to say what I feel. We had a man, an elder, that had an issue with me allowing Andy, amen, a drug dealer, and lived a perverted, per perverted dirty lifestyle to live in my office. And I said, Brother, 
I'm sorry you have an issue with that. In fact, he slid a note under the door when I got to church, amen, on a Wednesday night. And he said, take my name off of, he was a trustee, he said, take my name off of everything, pastor. And may the gods of Sodom bless you. He got in his mind that Andy was homosexual. And Andy had some problems, but that wasn't his problem. If anything, he'd been with a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of women in the lifestyle he'd been involved in. But he got in his mind that, that what we were doing, loving people, showing mercy to people that come in. Listen to me, folks. If anywhere's got to be a house of mercy, it's Solid Rock Church. Because they're out there, and they're hurting, and they're broken, uh, and they're drug dealers, and they're drug addicts and they're fornicators and adulterers uh, you name it liars and thieves uh, amen such were some of you amen aren't you thankful for that four letter word w-e-r-e -E? but now are we washed now are we covered in the blood I'm thankful God didn't give up on me amen you ought to be thankful God didn't give up on you but he showed you mercy at a place called mercy Hallelujah. He resigned. That man left. I was upset about it, of course. I loved him and his family. But that Sunday, amen, let me show you what God did. And he had guests there. Other, people's had, other people had guests there. And I watched that Sunday morning. We broke through something in the realm of the Spirit in that church. It broke something where we were never the same again, Pastor. Because we loved sinners right where they were. And showed them mercy. And began to show them how God can change their life. Transform and deliver. Hallelujah. And on that Sunday, we had 26 people born again of the water and of the Spirit. We weren't running but about a hundred at the time but in one Sunday we had 26 more than they had ever seen in one service we broke into revival from there that launched us into a season of harvest where we eventually were running 300 folks we took 30 when we got there there was 300 when we left three and a half years later you know why there were people just like Andy and Dale hey man I'm talking about first generation sinners that have been forgiven much they love much and we fill the house with people that needed the mercy of almighty God I'm preaching to you today that he is a God of deliverance and it doesn't matter where they come from he is able to change their life you believe that lift your hands and entertain the presence of the Lord hallelujah hallelujah come on somebody right now would you help me love the Lord? I don't have time to preach about Chuck that was a bouncer, amen, down at the adult bars. Amen, he was a bouncer. God changed his life. I don't have time to preach about Joe who had all kind of habits and marijuana and cocaine crack and he kept on coming. God kept on loving him. God changed Joe's life because he's a God of deliverance he's a God of transformation Amen. and so he established that and then we come to the pool the pool of Bethesda the Bible said it meaning interpreted meaning the house of mercy if anywhere has to be a place of mercy it's solid rock church it's got to be a house of refuge in this place and in this city called Kenneth. Jesus comes to a place where all manner of folks were. All manner. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody. That's us today. All manner of folks were there. They had all kind of issues and problems. Turn to somebody and say, you look like you have issues. Say it smiling, please. Especially to our guests. We all have issues, don't we? We all have issues. Whether you look like it or not, you got issues. I do too. We all have issues. Hallelujah. The Bible said there were all manner of folks. They had all kind of problems. They had all kind of needs. They had all kind of issues. And so Jesus comes to that place where they were gathered around in anticipation of an angelic visitation. They were watching 
They were withered and they were waiting for an angel to come and trouble the water. And the first one, the Bible said, to respond. They were the one that would walk away that day receiving their miracle. And so Jesus Christ, the answer walks into an environment of desperate and determined people. Everybody's looking for an answer. Everybody has issues. Everybody is needing a miracle. They're fighting and jostling for position. Imagine that if we were here today and only one person could get a miracle. They'd be fighting and running and hustling trying to get in front of somebody else. That's the atmosphere that the Bible describes they only only one person could leave with a miracle and so there was fighting and jostling to try and get as close to the pool as they could so that they could receive an answer, the miraculous. And so it was into that environment of anxiety and depression and desperation walks Jesus Christ, the answer, Jesus, the deliverer of just the previous chapter, Jesus, the transformer of a couple of chapters back, Jesus, that turned the water to wine. Jesus that delivered the demoniac, the one that can heal anybody, the miracle worker, the one that causes demons to flee and devils to cry out, the one that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Jesus walked into the environment of hurting, broken, and halt, maimed people. Hallelujah. When he walked into that environment, just like he's walked into this service today, where all kinds of issues are here. And I'm not going to walk the aisles today and call anybody out, I don't believe. But somebody over here needs a breakthrough in their home and their family. Somebody over here is dealing with addictions. Somebody over here is struggling with pornography. Somebody over here is dealing with depression and anxiety and panic attacks. We're broken people. We're flawed flesh. Every one of us, we struggle with our thought life. We're frustrated with failures. Somebody here today has family problems, our marriage problems, our finances problems and we're all dealing with our own issues and challenges and struggles and somebody got a bad doctor report and somebody got a bad report from somebody else but into the midst of our problems and our issues has walked the answer the problem solver the Jesus that was there at the pool and the house of mercy. He has walked into this service today. Hallelujah. And I feel His presence here. Would you lift your hands and just entertain the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Into this environment of defeat and discouragement walks a deliverer today. A healer is in the house. And I'm just crazy enough to believe that we can leave differently than the way that we came. That was the Old Testament law. If you came in the north door, you had to leave the east, the west, or the south. Came in the west, you had to leave north, south, or east. Because God was establishing the fact that no matter how we come into His house, it is never God's plan or will for us to leave the same way that we came. Amen. God doesn't want us to leave dragging the same issues and problems and struggles with us today. But there is a miracle in a place called mercy. It doesn't matter how long you've struggled. Uh, this man had been wrestling with this issue for 38 years of his life. Uh, three, almost four decades of suffering uh, and somebody else beating him to his answer and his miracle. Uh, I'm preaching to somebody today you know exactly what that is like. You have prayed before and been prayed for before, but it seemed the heavens are brass. 
and there's no breakthrough as of yet and somebody always beats you to it somebody else always gets the answer and you leave the same as you came but I believe right here today God sent me with a word for somebody today that you're about to have a breakthrough at Bethesda there's about to be a miracle at a place called mercy today Tap your hands and give God a great, great, great Holy Ghost praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And so there he is, waiting, 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 waiting on an answer. And here walks up Jesus, hallelujah. And he says unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou? receive a miracle do you want a miracle or not that's something you ought to ask yourself do I want a miracle or not and Jesus asked him that very pointed question and he began to notice in our text he began to give a list of excuses or reasons why he could not receive a miracle all kinds of excuses hallelujah I've been preaching long enough this pastor you know what I'm talking about where I've heard all kinds of excuses as to why people can't live for God or can't receive what God has for them and can't break through and get a miracle but you don't understand pastor my family but you don't understand pastor my spouse but my kid if my kids would live for God then I would live for God if my spouse would live for God then I would live for God if the pastor would call me every day I'd live for God if the pastor would pay my bills sometime I'd live for God I'm telling you I've heard it all if you love if you really love me pastor you pay my electric bill and I'd be faithful to church and I'm not talking about crisis when we get in a struggle and we need a little help I'm not talking about that I'm talking about excuses I'm telling you if you're looking for an excuse as to why you can't receive see a miracle from God or an excuse as to why you can't have revival in your family or revival in your church hell will supply a thousand reasons hallelujah well it's too hot well it's too cold I've heard that in the same service well the sounds too loud it's not loud enough I've heard that in the same service well sister so and so Hogs the mic too much. I'm serious. I had somebody about backslide because the person they were singing with, we couldn't afford a bunch of cordless mics at that time, so they had to share mics. And we'll sit so and so hogs the mic too much. I don't even know why I should sing. Smile at somebody and say, Oh my. Well, the pastor's reaching for the loss too much. I think he needs to preach to me. I had a lady pastor and an evangelist come in two weeks. We were two weeks into revival, and he just preached evangelistically, reaching for the lost. That's our calling. Our calling is to uh, have a great conviction about the Great Commission and to reach the lost. In two weeks, and she got upset, Zach, and she said, I think I just need to go to another church where somebody will preach to me. She'd been living for God for almost 40 years she had the uniform and everything you know what I'm talking about if you don't I'm not going to explain but she, she looked the part she acted the part for the most part but she got a little upset because we were reaching for the loss too much hallelujah well I felt a little bump in some of that that I said I'm not here to meddle I promise you I'm not your pastor I'm just going to obey the Holy Ghost what I feel I had a man pastor that he he, his kids had gotten lice from some people he said at church and you know that happens at schools it happens in churches it happens you got a bunch of kids it can happen and he wanted us to literally brother Jason he wanted us to good to see you and your family again amen uh, he wanted us to line them up pastor at, instead of having church that day we're going to have a lice inspection at church and we're going to get the chairs and the tooth combs and all of that and we're going to let everybody file by and find out who has lice. I said, brother, we can't do that. we got to have church. we got to have revival. Now I'll send a letter home and we'll do everything the schools do to make sure we take care of it. And he got so upset 
that I wouldn't handle it the way that he wanted me to handle it. Amen. That he quit, went to another church. Come to find out he'd been to four churches in about a year and a half because no matter where he went, nobody could do it the way that he thought it ought to be done. Isn't it funny how people can use an excuse of something as little as a louse, something as microscopic and little, and say, that's my excuse. That's why I can't live for God. That's why I can't live this. That's why I can't do that. Because of an excuse. Listen, folks, if you're looking for an excuse, the devil will supply. But somewhere, sometime, all of us, uh, we have to bring our last excuse to the altar and say, God, it's not brother so-and-so's fault. It's not the preacher's fault. It's not my wife or my husband's fault. I'm telling you, you can live for God if you want to live for God. And the devil can't keep you from being on fire for God. The devil can't keep you from getting a miracle today. The devil can't keep you from getting the Holy Ghost today. But you got to have a made up mind that says, I'm going to bring my issue and my last excuse to the altar. Give it to God and watch a miracle at a place called mercy. Clap your hands and give God glory and praise. Musicians, if you get ready to help me, I'm going to try and land this thing as quickly as I can. Talking about excuses the devil will supply. Excuses the devil will supply. And so Jesus walks up to this man says, Do you want a miracle or not? And right then he had to decide, Am I going to let excuses or tradition and what normally happens rob me of a miracle? Or am I going to get up, take the cot that I've been sleeping on, my excuse, my comfort, and give it to God and watch what God can do if I will simply obey? Why not try it? Do you hear me today? Why not? Like the water pots. What's it going to hurt? You tried everything else. You've tried a lot of things and it still hadn't fixed the issue or the problem. Why not try Je why not try Jesus? Why not try the answer? He is the answer. But here is a man arguing with the answer about the answer. And that's just like we do, isn't it, sometimes? I've been guilty of that. And I stand there telling God the list of reasons why it can't happen in my church or in my family or in my city but but preacher but you don't understand I've been bound by this a long time but but Lord my dad's an alcoholic I struggle with alcoholism but you don't understand uh, my, my family history but I have a disposition that, that makes me have an addictive personality or character traits where I, I, I have that, I, I struggle with that. But preacher, you don't understand. But evangelist, you don't understand. But it's my marriage. But it's my mom. It's my dad. Hallelujah. At some point, we have to bring every excuse and say, Lord, I'm through arguing with you about a miracle and about the answer. I'm going to bring my last excuse to the altar and give it to God and watch what the Lord can... Why not try it, hell man? It can't hurt anything. Why not try the Holy Ghost? Why not try breaking through? Why not try being baptized in Jesus' name? Hallelujah. Somewhere, sometime, we have to bring our last excuse to the altar. 38 years, elder. I just don't know. Finally, instead of arguing with the answer about the answer, the Bible said that he picked up that cot and he was obedient to the instruction of the Lord. Do you want a miracle or not? See, that's what you got to decide today while I'm preaching and before I open this altar officially. you got to determine today, do I want God to touch me or not? That's evangelistic preaching. It brings us to a place where it demands a verdict, a decision. i got to decide, am I going to receive something from the Lord at the altar today or am I going to leave the way that I came? 
a decision and demands a verdict. Am I going to allow the Lord to touch me and refill and renew me today? Listen, folks, there's a lot of us. I need, I need to be refilled today. Everybody here, you need to be filled or refilled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But we have to make up our mind. We start giving the reasons, but, 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 pastor, but, preacher, but, evangelist. But I've tried this and I've tried that. When you get in the presence of the Master, the answer, it's time to quit arguing and it's time to step out by faith and step into the pool in the house of mercy. Stand with me if you would. Lift your hands all over this house and help me begin to create an environment of faith, expectation, and even conviction. That's it, saints. Would you pray out loud? Not a silent, intimidated prayer or praise, but lift your voice. We're getting ready to open this altar. God's going to fill people with His Spirit today. God's going to heal somebody. It may as well be you. God's going to deliver somebody. He's a God of deliverance. He's a God of transformation. He's a God of mercy. That's what I'm preaching to you today. And He's a God of miracles. That's my sermon in a nutshell. He's a God of transformation. He's a God of deliverance. He's a God of mercy. And He's a God of miracles. Yeah. Hallelujah. Would you reach over now and pray for that person beside you? Make a point of contact if you please. Husband to wife, wife to husband, brother to brother, sister to sister, nobody alone. Would you make a point of contact? Would you really begin to pray? God, every attack that's come against them, everything that they've battled, every issue they've struggled with, God, let there be a breakthrough at Bethesda today. Let there be a deliverance at the altar today. Do you want a miracle or not? Do you want a breakthrough or not? If we do, we can't sit back and keep waiting and arguing with the answer when our answer is in this building. Our answer is in this altar today. And one touch of the Master's hand. And you can leave with a breakthrough. Hallelujah. You know what I think we need to do today? I want you to gather with me. Every guest and every faithful saint. Just three minutes, if that's it. Just everybody move in this direction quickly. Let's fill the altars quickly. Please don't make somebody say, excuse me, can I get by you and get to the altar? Clear the pew so somebody can get out and get to the altar. Even if you just step in the aisle, that's fine. Just get up and get to Jesus. Just get up from where you are and get to Him. Bring it to the Master, whatever your issue is today. And spend five minutes at an altar and say, God, I'm sick and tired of excuses and traditions robbing me of a miracle I'm through arguing with the answer I'm through arguing with the answer I need a touch from the Lord today now when you get to this altar would you reach over and join with somebody lift one hand to heaven lay a hand on a shoulder or somebody's back and begin to pray God I thank you for 27 years of this house of mercy 27 years that this has been a house of transformation 27 years it's been a house of deliverance 27 years it's been a house of mercy God let it continue to be a house of miracles and signs and wonders confirm your word today with signs following Give somebody the breakthrough that they need for their issue. That's it, intercessors. Come on, intercessors. Throw another log on the fire. Lift up your voice. Praise and worship intercede God my brother my sister they need a breakthrough today they need a miracle today they need deliverance today
Yes, sing it, brother. Sing it loud. Lift your voice. Praise Him aloud. Let the Holy Ghost move from the left to the right. Like a chain reaction, let there be a ripple effect of revival and restoration and renewal and refilling. That's it. That's it. A miracle at a place called mercy. There's mercy for you today, sir. There's mercy. There's precious blood that's here today. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, there's water ready. We'll baptize you today. You can leave with your sins washed in the blood. You can leave the day filled with the Spirit, renewed in the Holy Ghost. Would you pray? Would you pray aloud? That's it. Pray for your brother. Pray for somebody near you. Step across the altar if you have to. Be led of the Holy Ghost. Be led of the Spirit. God, my brother needs a breakthrough at Bethesda. They need a healing today. They need a miracle today.
hands one more time. Come on. Come on, sing it one more time. Come on, everybody. I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. the glory of the Lord in this place. Anybody feel the glory of the Lord? Come on, stretch your hands to heaven right now. Come on. Come on, one more time, brother. I'm going to leave you guys alone one more time. Just say, keep it right where it is. Keep it right where it is. Yeah. Come on, lift them hands to heaven. Yes. Hallelujah. Awesome glory presence of the Lord in this place. Come on, let's honor the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Wow. This reminds me of the services of where they would get drunk in the spirit. You just get a little tipsy. In the spirit, I feel the glory of the Lord here. Can I get a witness? Wow. Been on a journey. Amen. This morning in his presence. And what a word. I mean, the last two nights, we couldn't have had two better men to be a part of what we're doing. The Brother True and Chris Craft. I'm telling you, these guys knocked that ball plumb out of the park. Oh, thank you, Brother Chris, for that word this morning. Come on, let's give God some praise for the man of God. For the word, for the word, for the word. Wow. And let's give God some praise for our praise singers that just flowing and going in the Holy Ghost. Wow. Wow. Absolutely perfect. This is how I want to end the service or leave a building is knowing I've been in the presence and the glory of God I'm so thankful I can still feel him after all these years can I get a witness I'm glad he ain't left me I'm glad I just get better and better as the old timers would say get better and better that's just the truth so I want to say amen thank you so much for being here this morning and being here last night, you guys to sacrifice. We've been on a three-day fast last Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, and we've just been a, having a busy week here, seeking the Lord, and you hung right in, and I give God praise for each and every one of you. Thank you for being here this morning.